Sir Knight Armadillo, from tail tip to nose, in armor that's sure to bring terror to foes, goes forth with his weapons to his battleground, and looks like a pineapple walking around. Um, I thought poetry was supposed to be boring and serious, or mushy and gushy, like a love poem. Ugh. What is poetry? Poetry is writing that uses meaning, sound, and rhythm to create an emotional response and highlight parts of the human experience. And while we might read one or two lovey-dovey poems along the way in this course, sorry, poetry can be about any kind of human experience. It doesn't have to be all serious. There is slam poetry, where poets recite and perform their poems on stage. Epic poems that tell stories of lengthy journeys and battles. And some pretty funny poetry that's made me legitimately LOL a time or two. Can you picture that armadillo that looks like a pineapple walking around? <laughs> Elements of poetry can be grouped into four major categories. Imagery, form, figurative language, and sound devices. At the end of this video, you'll be able to identify elements of poetry in these categories and explain how they affect a poem's meaning, and you'll be ready to do close readings of poetry. Let's go for it. category of elements of poetry is imagery. Imagery, along with many of the other elements that were so important in fiction, will be just as important in poetry. So if you need a refresher, go back and watch the Elements of Fiction video now. Imagery, as you probably remember, uses descriptions to paint a picture the reader can visualize. Form means the physical structure of the poem, how it is made up. Poetry can take many different forms. When we read poems, we focus on lines and stanzas. A line is a single row of a poem, and lines are divided up into groups called stanzas. Let's take a look at the poem Our Land by Langston Hughes. We should have a land of sun of gorgeous sun, and a land of fragrant water, where the twilight is a soft bandana handkerchief of rose and gold, and not this land, where life is cold. We should have a land of trees, of tall, thick trees, bowed down with chattering parrots, brilliant as the day, and not this land, where birds are gray. Ah, we should have a land of joy, of love and joy and wine and song, and not this land where joy is wrong. How many stanzas do you see? Three! Just like when we were reading fiction, I've added some numbers on the side to help you. In poetry, we usually number the lines. The lines are numbered here, not the stanzas. What line of the poem is this? and not this land where birds are gray. Even though the number isn't written next to it, we can figure out that it's line 12. The poet chooses the form of their poem. They might change the word order to give meaning or add an effect. They might stop mid-sentence and go to the next line, or they might use repetition, repeating the same word, phrase, or line to emphasize it. Hughes repeats, and not this land, in his poem, to emphasize that this land is not what he desires. The next category is figurative language. Earlier in this course, we saw that figurative language develops a deeper meaning than what the text actually says. Figurative language plays a big role in poetry, so let's look closer at some specific kinds of figurative language an author might use personification, similes, and metaphors. Personification is when we take something that's not a person and personify it. We give it human characteristics. 
Let's take a look at "Be Clouded" by Emily Dickinson. The sky is low. The clouds are mean. A traveling flake of snow across a barn or through a rut debates if it will go. A narrow wind complains all day how someone treated him. Nature, like us, is sometimes caught without her diadem. Pause the video and try to find examples of personification. Where does Dickinson give human characteristics to things that aren't human? The clouds are mean. A narrow wind complains. A flake of snow debates. These are all examples of personification. Being mean is a human characteristic. Why do you think the poet used this phrase to describe a cloud? I think it means that the clouds are dark and it looks stormy. Next up, the simile. A poet writes a simile when they compare two things that are actually different and say they are similar. Similes use the words like or as. Similes are everywhere. Take a look at this poem and see if you can find a simile. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are! Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. I know what you're thinking. That's not a poem. It's a lullaby. But it was originally a poem written by Jane Taylor in 1806. Did you find a simile? The word "like" helps identify it. The poet is comparing stars and diamonds, saying they're similar. How does that help describe the star? It must be really shiny and bright if it's like a diamond. Metaphors also find similarities between two things, but a metaphor doesn't use the words "like" or "as." Metaphors say that something is something else, or treat one thing as another. Let's read part of Thanksgiving by Robert Nichols. Amazement fills my heart tonight, amaze and awful fears. I am a ship that sees no light, but blindly onward steers. Did you catch that metaphor? The speaker of the poem says, "I am a ship that sees no light." Is the author saying that the speaker is actually a ship? No way. How does the metaphor help the reader understand more about the speaker? I think it tells us that the speaker doesn't know where they are going or what they are doing, just like a ship with no light to guide it. Next is the category of sound devices. Poems are meant to be read out loud. Sound devices are elements of poetry that use sound to add meaning. The rhyme scheme of a poem affects the sound. Rhyme happens when words have the same ending sound. Poems don't have to rhyme at all, but when they do, the poet chooses the rhyme scheme they want to use, like every line or every other. What's the rhyme scheme in "Little Things" by Ebenezer Cobham Brewer? Little drops of water. Little grains of sand make the mighty ocean and the pleasant land. Thus, the little minutes, humble though they be, make the mighty ages of eternity. Sand rhymes with land, and B rhymes with eternity. The other lines don't rhyme at all, do they? I love the rhythm of this poem. Rhythm is the regular, repeated sounds of words in a poem. When the poet is talking about things that are small, I hear a quicker rhythm with words with short syllables: little drops of water, little grains of sand. Then the rhythm changes for the last line to put an emphasis on the word eternity. Another sound device poets use is alliteration, which is when the same letter or beginning sound is repeated in words that are next to or close to one another. Ready for one more poem? <clears throat> <sighs> Betty bought a bought some butter. But said she, "This butter's bitter. If I put it in my batter, it will make my batter bitter. But a bit of bitter butter will but make my batter better." Oh. This is embarrassing.
All those B, B, B sounds. I think you can hear the alliteration. It creates quite a playful, humorous effect in this poem. So, imagery, form, figurative language, and sound devices. We analyze all of these elements of poetry and put them together to come up with a theme, of course. As you remember, a theme is an author's central idea or message. In poetry, a theme could be a specific moral or a broader reflection on life and the human experience. But we also analyze these elements to support our understanding of the poem. People will have different opinions or views about what a poem might mean. So we need to use the elements of poetry as evidence to prove what we're thinking. Looks like you're ready to dive into reading poetry. I'll just be here practicing my alliteration. Betty Botta bought some butter, but said she, this butter's bitter. If I put it in my batter, 